Hi to everyone, my name is Tomaso Carraro and I'm the presenter of the paper A Look Inside the Black Box Towards the Interpretability of Conditional and Variational Decoder for Collaborative Filtering. I am a computer science student at the University of Padua. I'm doing my master's degree thesis. I've done this paper together with Mico Polato, that is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Padua, and Fabio Ioli, that is my thesis supervisor. First of all, I want to begin this presentation with a little bit of background about recommendation systems. Recommendation systems are models used to predict the ratings a user will give to items of a desired platform, for example, Netflix or Amazon. They are widely used in commercial applications, for example, music or video streaming and e-commerce sites. And they are used because usually items in this application are really huge in number, so users need a way to be helped in their decision process. Collaborative filtering is the standard approach used for recommendation systems and how this works. It simply recommends items based on a similarity computed between the users of the systems. In fact, the core idea of collaborative filtering is that similar users should have also similar tastes. In this paper, we work on model designed for the top hand item recommendation task. In this task, the goal is to produce a ranking for the user where the top and position of this ranking are covered by the items that are most appealing for the user. At the beginning of recommendation systems, simple and detailed approach have been proposed by researchers to tackle the recommendation problem. Firstly, similarity based method has been introduced and then latent factor model has been proposed and also dominated the recommendation system for many years. Since these methods are really intuitive and simpler in the architecture than the models, they are also really easy in the interpretation. However, in the last few years, with the deep learning rise, a constant increase in number of deep collaborative filtering models have appeared in the literature. These models can be really accurate, thanks to their really high non-linearity, but also they are black box, and this means that they take the input, they produce the output, but they don't produce any explanations about the process they used. So there is a lot of skepticism in their usage. To try to solve this problem, many efforts have been devoted by researchers in the years. In the majority of words, supplementary knowledge is injected to try to make the models more explainable. However, in the last few years, generative methods have shown promising results with recommendation systems. So they are widely used instead of the discriminative models. Examples of generative models using recommendation systems are generative adversarial network and variational autoencoders. However, these models are not explainable or interpretable by design, so an explanation is welcome. And this is what we have tried to do with this work. But what are the difference between discriminative and generative models? Discriminative models learn the boundary between classes, while generative models model the distribution of individual classes in the dataset. Okay, so now there are some slides of background about autoencoders and variational autoencoders to help you understand the papers. So, uh, what are autoencoders? Autoencoders are unsupervised machine learning models based on neural networks that learn an identity function that reconstruct the input while compressing the data in the process. Thanks to these compressive capabilities, they are widely used for dimensionality reduction. The learning process of the autoencoder aims at minimizing the rec reconstruction loss that is usually the mean square error between the input and the output. Minimizing the mean square error means minimize the differences between the input and the output. Variational autoencoders are still autoencoders, but their theoretical backbone is rooted in the Bayesian inference. The core difference between variational autoencoder and autoencoder is how inputs are encoded into the latent space. Autoencoder maps the input vector in a low dimensional vector. Instead, variational decoder maps the input x into a probability distribution that is usually a Gaussian probability distribution. The training of variational autoencoders is also different from the training of autoencoders. In fact, a sampling operation is required since the encoder network of the model outputs a probability distribution that has a mean and a variance. And also, the loss factor is really different because there is the reconstruction loss, as in autoencoders, plus a callback Lieber loss. This loss works as a regularizer of the latent space by penalizing space that are far away from a normal distribution with zero mean and one variance. Here you can see the architecture of the variational autoencoder. You can see that it's really similar to a normal autoencoder, but the input vector is mapped by the encoder in a probability distribution that has a mean and a variance. Then a sampling operation has to be performed to sample a vector from which the decoder try to reconstruct the initial vector. This sampling operation can be performed using the so-called reparameterization trick. This trick consists in sampling an epsilon vector 
from a normal distribution of zero mean and variance one, multiply it for the standard deviation of the Gaussian distribution we are trying to learn, and finally add it to the mean of this Gaussian distribution. Thanks to this reparameterization trick, we are able to learn this model with gradient descent because by design, the sampling operation is not differentiable. The conditional variational autoencoder is a variant of the multinomial variational autoencoder, that is the state of the art variational decoder used in the top n item recommendation task. The most important contribution of multinomial variational autoencoder is the reconstruction loss, that is a multinomial loss. Thanks to this particular loss, the model is able to include in the gradient computation only those items that the user has clicked on. In this way, the model is able to learn how to generate a ranking over the items that the user has not interacted with. The main difference between conditional variation autoencoder and multinomial variation autoencoder is that the conditional variation autoencoder allows to specify a constraint in the recommendation. For example, a user can specify a movie genre that is willing to watch. This is achieved by adding a one out condition vector at the input of the model. The training of conditional variation autoencoder is also different from the training of multinomial variation autoencoder. In fact, the extraction loss demote the items that do not satisfy the condition. Here you can see the architecture of the conditional and variation autoencoder. There is the user rating vectors. A dropout layer is applied to this vector. A one out condition vector is added to the input, and then everything is fed to the encoder. Then the decoder outputs an unnormalized ranking over the item set. How the training of this conditional and variation autoencoder works? First of all, we have selected a movie-less 20 million dataset. It is one of the most popular datasets used for movie recommendations. Then we have selected the genres of the movies as conditions for the training. In particular, we have decided to use this specific dataset because it contains auxiliary information that can be used for making the condition our condition evaluation autoencoder. However, this is not the only dataset that contains auxiliary information. So this setting can be obtained with all the other datasets that contains auxiliary information, for example, the movie genres. In the training set, each user appear conditioned with all the genre of the movie he has watched plus without condition, that is a condition vector made of zeros. This means that if a user has seen movies that belongs to three genre in total, it will appear in the training set four times. Here, there is an example of what happens when we try to train a condition evaluation on the coder on the movie lens 20 million dataset. Here we can see that the user in input has watched four movies in total with drama, action, drama, and horror as genres, and that he has expressed a condition that is the drama genre, so he wants to see a movie that is a drama movie. Here we can see that in the output, the drama movies have the best scores. And if we order this how to put, we can see that uh, in the top end, there are only drama movies. That is what we wanted to obtain. So we can see that the reconstruction loss has done its job. To try to explain the condition and variation autoencoder model, we decided to explore its learned latent representation. In particular, we have analyzed what happens in the latent space when we change the condition for a group of users. To perform the latent space exploration of the condition and variation autoencoder, after the training, we selected 2,000 random users from the training set of the movie 20 million datasets. We conditioned all of them with all the possible genres, one genre per time, and also without the condition. And finally, we took the learned latent representation of this condition and the user and performed principal component analysis on them. On our experiment, we considered only the first five principal components and discussed only the most interpretable pairs of principal components. Here, there is the plot of the second and fifth principal components. It's possible to observe that very different genres are placed in really far apart locations, where similar genres are placed in Airbnb clusters. For example, the general world is far away from children and animation, while it is near drama and romance. Then, popular genres such as action, comedy, drama, and romance are placed near the center of the space, and not conditional user are placed at the center of the space. And this is reasonable because when we try to recommend movies without conditioning on a specific genre, the most popular genre becomes more likely. Finally, it is possible to assert that the film art genre has been placed far away from all the other genres. In fact, it is difficult to place this specific genre near other genres. However, the model has been able to place the genre near crime, drama, thriller, and mystery. This is the package of genre that is nearest the film art genre. Watching the plot between the third and fifth principal components, 
we think that the third principal component captures the emotional theme of the genres. In fact, genres that share many emotional components are almost completely overlapped. For example, mystery and horror that shares anxiety, tension, and sometimes fear. Similar observation can be done for other pairs such as children and fantasy or also war and western. Finally, we have also observed that given the inner representation of the latent space, we are able to construct user profiles. We have already said that the non-condition and the user cluster is placed at the center of the latent space, but it is possible to observe also that it spreads to any direction, and this suggests users' particular tastes. For example, we can say that users who lie in the bottom of the cluster are more inclined to light entertainment, while users in the top part of the cluster are mainly interested in some serious movies, for example, thriller, action, crime. In this paper, we have discovered that the condition and variation of the encoder autonomously performs clustering of the inputs in the latent space. It is not too surprising that the models have learned uh, which pairs of genres work well together. However, the relative position in the space and the overall correlation between genres is something that has been learned through the collaborative information provided by the user. Also, thanks to the Kullback labor loss, the model has been able to place compatible genres in nearby clusters. Finally, we can say that given the interpretation of the latent space, it is possible to construct user profiles that can be leveraged to improve the recommendation and also to provide the user a way to check out the system that strap their tastes. Okay, so we are arrived at acknowledgement. First of all, I want to thank you all for watching this video. Then I want to thank Fabio, my team supervisors, that gave me the opportunity to present this work to you. And finally, I want to thank Mirko that helped me during the preparation of this paper.